So um, this is a lecture to hopefully replace uh, one of the uh, lectures that you may have seen. It's recorded from my in-person Physics of 4C class a while back. Uh, that I called Postulate to Special Relativity, video one, and the second video that's uh, closely related, uh, Relativity of Simultaneity. So, uh, so let me get started. Um, so uh, before we got to this point, we talked about the first postulate of uh, special relativity, uh, which uh, one might call the principle of relativity, um, that is, laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. And um, you might call this principle of relativity. And it's a really old principle. Galileo is often credited with having realized it with his um, like a sailor in the um, underhold of a ship. You know, could the sailor figure out if the ship is moving or not, if it's a really gentle ride. We talked about that already, so let me just leave that be. Now, this is the what we will call first postulate of special relativity. It's uh, um, so so uh, special relativity is um, special over all the uh, theories, laws of uh, physics that you might learn. So, especially in contrast to the quantum mechanics that we'll cover soon. Special relativity can be almost uh, uh, mathematically derived. Uh, a lot of things in physics, it took a lot of experiments for people to figure out what the laws are. Uh, you know, Maxwell's uh, equations in electromagnetism, they were like that. Each equation had to be discovered by someone doing experiments. Um, it, it's only at the very near the very end where you know Maxwell could discover his Maxwell term in 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 the Ampere's law by theoretical investigation, and um, the the really special and um, remarkable thing about special relativity is that um, you can mathematically drive everything in special relativity from these two principles and all the other existing laws of physics. So I gave you the first postulate of special relativity, and the second postulate of special relativity is this. It's, uh, um, let me state it in the way I think it's typically stated. Um, the speed of light in vacuum is always at a constant value that we uh, have given the letter C to. Um, C is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And I think uh, maybe if we want to emphasize, you might emphasize it this way. It's always at C in all inertial reference frames. One might think that's um, kind of an odd and specific thing to say, you know, unless you heard about it before from popular science and whatnot. <laughs> um, so the way I like to call this, um, the way to give it a succinct name that I hope people will uh, remember is this name. I like to call this correctness of Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics. Well, I guess that's kind of long. <laughs> uh, the reason I call it this way is because if you assume that what you learned about electromagnetism in physics of 4B is correct, which, you know, why wouldn't you assume that? Then um, it follows from the first postulate that laws of physics, which contains Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics, uh, laws of physics says uh, light travels at sea. This is actually you can, something you can derive. From Maxwell's equations, you can derive a, a wave equation. And that wave equation says the electromagnetic wave has a speed of C, or in terms of the um, constants in the electric and magnetic things in, um, in the basic SI unit, equals as 1 over square root of uh, epsilon naught mu naught. I think that's right. Um, so since this expression falls out of a law of physics, Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics, if uh, Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics is correct, then this must be correct, that speed of light in vacuum is always SC. 
And uh, I think from our perspective, in the 21st century, uh, it might be kind of odd to say this as an explicit thing. But in Einstein's time, you know, at the turn of the century, beginning of 20th century, Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics was pretty young, I think less than 50 years old. So there were some people uh, who um, tried to come up with corrections to Maxwell's theory. That's what the whole search for luminiferous ether was about. And... Um, and Einstein's bold assumption is to assume that this new, less than half a century old theory is actually correct, uh, that it can be pushed to limit and it won't break. So, so those are the two postulates of uh, those are the two postulates of special relativity. And unlike almost anything else you do in physics, you can build the rest of the theory of special relativity out of these two postulates. Like you are, you know, driving uh, theorems and lemmas and stuff that mathematicians do when they develop like axiomatic set theory. So these postulates, you can almost think of it like axioms of special relativity, except, you know, axioms are more of a mathematical thing and we physicists prefer the words like postulate and hypothesis and principle. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, so in, in principle, you can drive everything in special relativity from these two postulates. So let me do it uh, first application, which is this, uh, what you are, we are going to discover as relativity of a simultaneity. So you're going to hear about a lot of uh, thought experiments or Gedanken experiments, which is uh, describing a setup and uh, assuming that all the laws of physics that we know are correct, including these two postulates of special relativity, and then following its consequences. That's all we mean by thought experiment. It's no more um, exotic than that. So let me uh, draw this picture for you. So imagine we have a vehicle, a relativistic train that's going to have some stuff set up. Uh, let's just describe it uh, concretely. So it's got some length L, it's how long it, it is. And it's equipped with a special device in the middle or very middle of the train. The device is called a light bulb. Oh, I guess it's not that special. It's just a light bulb. Uh, it's a pulsed light bulb. I guess that's what's special about it. You can emit a single pulse and you can kind of, um, so, you know, it emits a pulse of light and then it travels the way light travels. <laughs> and uh, it's got two more special devices. There's a detector at the front of the train. I'm going to say train's going to be end up moving that way. So this will be the front. Let's call that uh, front F. Um, and at the back of the train, let's call that B. Oh, that's going to be so confusing. Um, rear, let's call that R, rear of the train. Um, there are detectors. So when you emit this pulse of light, the detectors at the front and the back can detect when the light has arrived. So it, they are, uh, when they are functioning, they can measure time at front when the light pulse has hit the front and the time at the rear when the light pulses hit the rear of the train. Good. <laughs> I think uh, um, all of that hopefully makes a sense. So I think uh, if you imagine uh, me lighting this up, you know, emit the pulse, then the way I've set up where this is in the middle, hopefully you have uh, this intuitive sense that by the time light pulses hit those two detectors, these two times, the TF and TR, should be the same. Good. And this is what someone might call simultaneous at the same time, you know, meaning these two values of time are the same. <laughs> so, so that's uh, what we are used to experiencing. You can set up experiments in such a way that um, when you do that experiment, you get simultaneous things. And um, just to keep in keep with the tradition, we can say that um, Alice is riding in this train. So Alice is the one who oversees all these experiments and makes it sure, yeah, the TF is equal to TR. I, um, I inspected all the documents. There's nothing broken, nothing misbehaving. And Alice uh, signs off her name to the fact that, yes, these two are simultaneous. Now we want to imagine that this train is moving. 
Moving at some descent speed, let's say 0.833c, um, about, you know, 83% um, of speed of light. <laughs> Very realistic. Um, and we are going to introduce a new person, Bob, who's not on the train, but he's the, the station, um, station manager. So Bob is uh, standing here outside the train. Looking at this train, moving at the speed, 83% of speed of light. And when Alice comes back to Bob saying, yeah, I set all this up. I measured the times. They were simultaneous. Bob tells Alice, um, that's not what I saw. I saw light hitting one end faster the, than the other end. I think uh, if I'm getting it right, when Bob measures those times, Bob will measure it such that the time that the light hits the rear is earlier than the time that the light hits the front. That's what Bob says. And he says, Alice is wrong. <laughs> so, you know, who's right? Is Bob wrong? Because, you know, he's uh, kind of far away from the equipment. So maybe that's why he didn't see it correctly. Um, oh, by the way, I want to make sure that uh, we draw this distinction between seeing and observing. And watch how I didn't put Alice in the middle of the train because it really wasn't necessary. So if I'm describing what Alice sees, Alice will actually see what's happening up here. She will see this earlier than what she sees back here. But, you know, Alice is smart. She's not stupid. She's smart. She knows that she's closer to the front than the rear. So she knows that when she sees the, this event happening before, she knows that, oh, that's happening because I'm closer to it. She knows that when she sees this event happening later, she knows that, yeah, it's because there's a travel time for the signal. That's why I'm seeing that later. So because Alice is smart and aware of light's finite propagation time, she makes those corrections. She corrects it for, okay, the distances and um, the conclusion that she draws after having made all those corrections. That's what we are going to refer to as observing. So whenever we are using the word observing, uh, what we are saying is that all those tiny little minor, really trivial corrections have been made. And what remains is a true, real relativistic effect. So where Alice is, is where Bob is, it actually doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is what reference frame they are in. So let's try to describe what's happening here from Bob's reference frame. So uh, the way this is drawn, the train appears stationary, so let's actually, you know, uh, draw, a, make a copy of it down here and redraw it so that we can draw it from Bob's perspective with the train moving. So uh, let's uh, break it up into a few snapshots. So there's that moment in time, and, and I guess we don't really need Alice, so let me not draw her trying to draw fewer things. <laughs> uh, so there's uh, this snapshot that you drawn is the moment in which the light was emitted, okay? The train moving forward at 83% of speed of light, it'll be moving forward. And let me draw in green um, where the um, train will be at some point later. Let's say um, in the amount of time that light travels to, not quite here, but in, in the amount of time light travels to somewhere here, about halfway, and somewhere there, about halfway, train has moved. And the train will have moved, I think, I'm trying to draw it to scale. Maybe something around here, it'll have moved to position like this, from snapshot one to two. This will be the position of the train in snapshot two. You can see that ah, between these two and the next equal size the time interval, the light will hit the train, uh, the rear of the train. Uh, let's uh, like mark the location here. Um, there will be a uh, an event detection of this light pulse at the rear of the train, and let me label the time there with the not tr because I think that gets confusing. Let me prime it so that it's a different symbol for a different number potentially. Now, while that's happening, I think the, uh, in the snapshot three, in about equal amount of time, so the light has traveled to here. Front of the train keeps moving. Let me draw that in purple. 
So in that equal size time interval, the tr front of the train will have when something like uh, this. So you know, in snapshot three, um, the light hasn't quite hit it yet. So it'll take you know snapshot four, five. At some much later time, is where the front of the train finally gets uh, hit by the light pulse, and now you register the time t front. Um, I'm not throwing this to scale, but from the description, you can kind of see why Bob would say what he said. That uh, when he uh, when he observed these two events of the light hitting the back of the train and the front of the train, that the event of the light hitting the back of the train occurred at an earlier time than the light hitting the front of the train. It's a quite <laughs> strange and counterintuitive effect. I think uh, uh, we are used to thinking of an absolute time. We are used to thinking that if uh, we have something that is uh, simultaneous, uh, we are used to thinking, assuming, presuming that the simultaneity is universal. That if uh, something was simultaneous for Alice, that it must be simultaneous for Bob. What we are seeing in this application of the, the principles of uh, uh, postulate of uh, special relativity is, and I don't think I've even explicitly invoked any um, actual postulate of special relativity, other than that, you know, light is traveling at speed of C. And I guess, um, uh, so I didn't explicitly invoke it, but if you are dealing with sound waves, for example, the way you would uh, uh, resolve this apparent contradiction is to say, oh, that's because the, um, so in Alice's frame, these two waves are traveling at the same speed. But in Bob's frame, you would say, oh, it, they, they are not traveling at the same speed. The one that's moving towards the front of the train, it moves at the speed of uh, its own speed plus whatever speed the train is moving. And the one that's moving backward, it's moving at whatever its own speed is, minus the speed of the train. Like for sound waves, that's how you do resolve it. And you would say that the, the event of arriving at the back and arriving at the front, they happen at the same time. So in the classical mechanics description, simultaneity is universal still. And what we are saying is that even though this is how we would handle things in a natural, intuitive way, what we are going to say from here on as we venture into special relativity is we are going to say explicitly that we don't trust our intuition. What we trust in is the postulate of special relativity. These are the absolutely true statements that are never wrong, even when they sound wrong. So even though the statement that the speed of light is always as C in all inertial reference frames, it will sound wrong to you until you get used to it, because you will want to correct the speed of the light. And what I ask you to do as a competent, good mathematician is to say, ignore this impulse, hold on to your axioms, say that what is true is the second postulate of special relativity. Light always travels at speed of C, even when you don't want to say that's true. So under that assumption, what I said is, yeah, um, light hits the back of the rear of the train before it'll hit the front of the train because the light going towards the front of the train isn't moving any faster from Bob's reference frame. It's still moving as C. Light going to the rear of the train is not any slower. It's also moving as C. Now, they are different in other ways. And the way they will be different will be, they'll be different in frequency. That's what um, will lead to something called the Doppler effect that we'll, I think, look at in uh, later, uh, maybe next week or the week after. So they are different in some other aspects. Their frequency can change, their wavelength can change, but what doesn't change is their speed of light. So, so yeah, uh, what, um, but what Bob observes of these two events is that they are not simultaneous. And, um, and this is what leads us to say simultaneity. So, you know, whenever two events appear to happen at the same time, that's what we call simultaneity. Simultaneity is relative. 
meaning if you have two events that is simultaneous in one inertial reference frame, like a TF and TR was here, then it's especially if they are separated in space, then it is possible to find another reference frame where they are not simultaneous. And um, I believe, especially in lower division textbooks, this um, fact is not given enough emphasis. And that leads to a lot of uh, confusions in like a special relativity paradoxes that some of which we'll see next week. So I wanted to uh, cite this uh, textbook that I like uh, really a lot. I brought a screenshot here so that I can refer to it in this lecture. Uh, this is a screenshot from a digital version of a textbook called Revolutions in 20th Century Physics by a really popular upper division textbook author, David Griffiths. And, and this particular textbook is actually not written for upper division content. It's written for physics for humanities majors. Um, but uh, it, it, I think it's worth reading even for um, engineering or future physics majors because there are certain insights that so succinctly summarized that um, as a lot of students are going through this physics first class will miss unless they take care to <laughs> pay attention to it. It's this paragraph that I want to refer to. Uh, relativity has nothing to do with what you observe, or relativity has to do with what you observe in the sense that we are talking about, not what you see with all the superior effects. We are talking about real effects, not appearances, and it's this sentence I want to bring your attention to. Einstein liked to say that all the conceptual difficulties of special relativity derive ultimately from the relativity of simultaneity. And as we explore relativistic paradoxes, you will see how many, you will, I hope you will be surprised by how many of the paradoxes do ultimately get resolved by correct understanding of simultaneity.